Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Volume 3 The Battle of Hatin the conquest of Jerusalem, and the Third Crusade. Start of Part 6 of Chapter 3 Outcome of the Third Crusade and the most important events before the death of Salah ad -Din. With the departure of Richard the Lionhearted to his homeland, after the Treaty of Ramlah, the Third Crusade came to an end. There would never be such a mass of kings and princes heading to the Islamic East again, even though Western Europe was united in this task and prepared a campaign which was one of the largest crusades. The results it achieved were minimal. What happened with regard to saving Tyre from the hands of Conrad de Montferrat and rescuing Tripoli from the Sicilian fleet took place before the Third Crusade arrived. All they contributed was to capture Acre and the coastal cities as far as Jaffa, in addition to the island of Cyprus. If one important thing was achieved, it was that they had managed to put a stop to the activities of Salah ad -Din in liberating other cities. Historians regard the Third Crusade as a failed campaign in the history of the Crusades, because it did not achieve results commensurate with the great efforts put into it, let alone the fact that it did not succeed in achieving the goal for which it had been brought into being, which was to take back Jerusalem from the Muslims. The military and political circumstances that this campaign faced played a role in its ultimate failure, because it was not possible for an army that was devoid of united leadership divided by political rivalry and fighting in a foreign land, to attain victory over armies that were united by one goal and one leadership, and which had all rallied under the leadership of one man, such as Salah ad -Din. One of the factors that led to failure was the fact that the kings of England and France brought with them to the east, the local political rivalry that existed between them, despite their agreement, before they had left Western Europe to overlook it. The spiritual nature of the campaign was largely absent, because in contrast to the First Crusade, the Pope did not play a large role in organizing this one. The Third Crusade was mostly of a political nature, with all its problems and contradictions operating in the background. The Islamic Front remained cohesive after the disappearance of religious and political disputes, even though the Muslims' military power began to decline, because they were so worn down and exhausted. The Islamic forces had had to carry out ongoing military operations for three years, and in unusual circumstances. In addition to this, tensions had arisen which Salah ad -Din dealt with wisely. Of these, we may mention the dispute that took place between the Turkish and Kurdish elements in his army. Were it not for the mercy of Allah, followed by the leadership of Salah ad -Din, there could have been great and unimaginable losses. Salah ad -Din's strong leadership and the steadfastness of the Muslims in the face of this fierce campaign caused frustration to the kings of Europe and made their plans fail, and they were unable to take back Jerusalem. This is regarded as a great victory for Salah ad -Din, despite the losses sustained by the Muslims. This crusade was distinguished by unprecedented understanding between the European Christians and the Muslims of the East. There were strong lines of communication between both parties, which led to the suggestion of a peace deal and the sending of fruits and ice to Richard the Lionhearted during his illness, 
and to sending Salahuddin's private physician to treat him. From this interaction, the following resulted in the life of Europe. A. They transmitted from the Muslims a great deal of science and knowledge, which was prevalent among them during that period. The Muslims had written books containing many new and innovative ideas, laying down the foundations of these sciences. B. They also transmitted from the Muslims many handicrafts and arts, such as the manufacture of textiles, dyes, enamel, metals and glass. They also transmitted from them the art of architecture, which had a profound effect on the industrial, commercial and artistic life of Europe. According to Gustave Le Bon, the influence of the Crusaders on manufacturing and the arts was no less than that. From the Muslims, Europe learned the manufacture of silk cloth and advanced methods of dyeing. And architecture soon changed completely. And C. Western civilization was influenced by the Islamic civilization to such a significant extent that it led to the growth and flourishing of Western civilization. Were it not for the Crusades, the growth of civilization in Europe would have been delayed as long as only Allah knows. Fair-minded Orientalists admitted this fact before the Muslim historians mentioned it. Gustave Le Bon writes, If we examine the long-term impact of the Crusades, it will become clear to us the importance of this impact. The West's contact with the East lasted for two centuries. The time during which the Crusaders were present in Muslim lands was one of the greatest factors that led to the development of civilization in Europe. Thus the Crusades produced a different result to that at which they were aimed. As for the East, it was enjoying a prosperous civilization thanks to the Muslims, whereas the West was sinking in an ocean of savagery. That is how Europe benefited from the Crusades, even though it suffered huge losses and fatal defeats, and it did not achieve what it came for, which was regaining Jerusalem from the Muslims. Nevertheless, it made all these great gains that revived Europe and quickly brought civilization to it. As for the Muslims, the Crusaders did not have anything that they could benefit from, because in their conduct they were like savages. They would rob friends and enemies alike, and slaughter them indiscriminately. The Crusader Bishop of Acre, Jacques de Vitry, described the invaders as follows. Nothing of them was seen in the promised land except heretics, thieves, adulterers, murderers, traitors, jokers, promiscuous monks and prostituted nuns. An army of prostitutes was brought with the crusade specifically to entertain the fighters. That was not limited to the crusader soldiers only. Rather, it went further to include immoral and evil people among the Muslims. Ibn Kathir wrote, Frankish reinforcements were coming by sea constantly. Frankish women came with the intention of fighting, and some came with the intention of comforting the strangers in a strange land, so that they might find some comfort, service, and physical enjoyment, because that way they would persevere with fighting and put up with being away from home. Even many immoral Muslims joined them because of these women, and this became a matter that was very well known. The historian Abu Shama mentioned that during the Crusader siege of Acre, a boat arrived on board which were 300 pretty Frankish women, who had come from different islands beyond the sea and had been asked to offer their services so they went to a foreign land to offer relief to those who were strangers in a strange land. Their aim was to offer themselves for free to those wretched people, and they would not refuse any man at all. They believed that there was no better act of charity or worship than this, 
especially if they offered their services to one who was single in a strange land. He also commented, Women came out to take part in the Third Crusade. Some of them came out wearing armor or men's clothing to take part themselves in the battles, because they believed that this was an act of worship. Others came out to offer relief to the strangers and to bring joy to the crusaders by making themselves available to the soldiers so that they would not feel tired and fed up. Salah ad-Din implemented the principle from fiqh of weighing the pros and cons. The Treaty of Ramlah came about because of economic and military circumstances, which made Salah ad-Din accept it, even though he knew that the Franks were in a weak situation. According to the estimates of his men and consultants, the departure of the Frankish military forces to their homelands was in their own interests, and their staying would lead to the arrival of new forces from Europe, which would cause harm to the Muslims. If we examine the history of treaties, agreements and truces that the Muslims formed with the Franks, such as those made by Imad ad-Din, Nur ad-Din Mahmud Zangi, and Salah ad-Din, we will see that they had some specific aims, principally to give the Muslim forces the opportunity to prepare themselves and increase their fighting capabilities in readiness for the next round or rounds against the Franks. Most of these agreements came about at the request of the Franks themselves, and the Muslim leaders would not hesitate to sign them. They served an interest for them to fight other principalities with whom there was no peace deal, to make things easy for the Muslims and give them freedom of movement and travel between Egypt and Syria, to make it easy for trade caravans to travel across Arab regions, or to provide security and reassurance to pilgrim caravans so that they could perform Hajj without being exposed to danger. As for the last peace deal, which was the peace deal of Ramlah, it was given a three-year limit, and Salah ad-Din and his consultants found that there were interests to be served by accepting this deal. These interests included the health problems that had begun to affect the soldiers, in addition to the battle fatigue and exhaustion that they were suffering. They thought that this was an opportunity to prepare for the coming rounds of battles. Ibn Shaddad noted, The Sultan thought that there was an interest to be served because the people were overwhelmed with exhaustion, lack of provisions and homesickness. So he wanted to give them time to rest, to forget the situation in which they found themselves, and to prosper again. He loaded Jerusalem with whatever weapons he could, and focused on building it up. Ibn Shaddad also mentions that Salah ad-Din was not happy with this peace deal, but he saw that it was in the interests of the Muslims, because the troops were so fatigued and had begun to show disobedience. Ibn Shaddad thought that the peace deal was in the interests of the Muslims, because Salah ad-Din died shortly thereafter. If his death had coincided with intense fighting between the Muslims and Franks, then Islam would have been in danger. Therefore, this treaty was no less than a blessing. The murder of Richard the Lionhearted After the Treaty of Ramlah, Richard set sail from Acre, heading back to his homeland. His ship sank at sea, but he managed to reach the coast safely. Then he entered the land of Austria in disguise, until he was recognized in one of the inns near the city of Vienna on 11 December 1192 Common Era. He was taken to Leopold, the Duke of Austria, who accused him of killing the Marquis Conrad de Montferrat. The Duke wanted to sell him to his enemies, but he soon handed him over to Henry VI, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and he remained in captivity until he paid a large ransom. Richard the Lionhearted was released in March 1194 Common Era, 
and he continued to fight his princely rivals until he was assassinated by an arrow and died on 26th March 1199 Common Era. After the demolition of Ascalon, a letter arrived from the deputies in Damascus, attached to which was a letter from Baghdad, from the embassy of the Caliph, which contained three main points. The first was an objection to al-Malik al-Muzaffar's going to Baghdad. The second was an objection to Muzaffar ad-Din's capture of Hassan ibn Kafjak and an order to return him to Karkhani. The third was an order to send al-Qadi al-Fadil to them to discuss matters with him. The Sultan responded to the first by saying, We did not tell him to do that. He responded to the second by noting that it was well known that Ibn Kafjak had spread mischief in the land, and he responded to the third by stating that he was very sick and was too weak to travel to Iraq. Al-Qadi al-Fadil also sent his apologies in writing for not going to the embassy. The city of Jerusalem was fortified and inspected after the peace deal. Al-Isfahani wrote, After the peace deal, the Sultan returned to Jerusalem to check on it and inspect the troops. He strengthened and fortified its walls, restored and beautified its historic sites, made its ditches deeper, paved its roads and added a market to the endowment of the school with all its shops and lands with all their gardens. He also organized the affairs of the Sufis, allocating complete endowments to guarantee them enough to live on. He allocated the church in Kumama Street to be turned into a hospital and brought to it drugs and medicines of all types. He extended the walls of Jerusalem as far as Mount Sion and incorporated it into the city. And he issued orders that the trenches be extended around the entire city. He decided to go on Hajj, but it was not decreed for him, and he regretted missing it after having prepared himself for it. He stayed in Al-Quds for the month of Ramadan, and was very generous and kind. He appointed Izzatin Jurdik as governor of Jerusalem, and its environs when he dismissed Husam ad-Din Siyarukh from this post, and he appointed his Mamluk, Alam ad-Din Qasr, as governor of the territories beyond Jerusalem, such as Hebron, Gaza, Darum, and Ascalon. Al-Qadi al-Fadil objected to Salah ad-Din's plan to go on Hajj. When Al-Qadi al-Fadil heard that the Sultan had decided to go on Hajj, he wrote to him advising him to cancel it on the basis that the Franks had not yet left Syria and they had not forgotten about Jerusalem. They could not be trusted not to break the peace deal. There is no guarantee if the Franks are still here. Our troops have dispersed and our Sultan is travelling for a specific, known period of absence, that they will not march one night and arrive at Jerusalem in the morning, catching it unawares, and enter it, Allah forbid, and it would be lost to Islam. In this case, your hut would become a major sin and unforgivable, a mistake which could never be overlooked. He added, The pilgrims of Iraq and Khurasan, are they not 200,000 or 300,000 strong or more? Is there any guarantee that it will not be said that the Sultan marched to settle some scores, shed blood, and disturb the hut so they would not go? then it would become a bad precedent. I seek refuge with Allah from that. These consequences are not unlikely, and foolish people are not unlikely to think that way. Your Highness, dealing with the wrongs done to the people is more important than anything by means of which you could draw closer to Allah. It is not only one case. Around Damascus, the wrongs done to the peasants make one wonder that rain still falls, and there is a great deal of injustice on the part of the fearfolders against those who are working for them. 
in the valleys of Parada and Zabadani, there is trouble and turmoil. The swords are still dripping with blood, and no one is trying to stop it. The Muslims have borders that need fortifications and weapons. Another essential task is the creation of a balance between the state's income and outgoings. It is impossible to spend without sufficient income or to have a branch without a root. This is a matter which we have discussed a great deal before, but His Highness was distracted from paying attention to it. Although the financial affairs of the state are in difficulty, when things settle down, Allah forbid that the problems come back. The most serious issue to be faced is the fact that the state treasury is empty. Your servant is not asking to collect more money from the people. Rather, he is asking to manage financial affairs in such a way that they stabilize. This letter indicates the depth of Al-Qadi al-Fadil's understanding of the aims of Islamic law. It also demonstrates the importance of the presence of devoted scholars alongside the political and military leadership. Sultan Salahuddin responded to Al-Qadi al-Fadil's advice. He listened to him, appreciated his sincerity, accepted it, and decided not to perform the Hajj that year. He wrote about that to all the provinces and remained in Jerusalem for the entire month of Ramadan fasting, praying, and reading the Qur'an. Every time one of the Christian leaders came to him, he honored him with a gift and showed him generosity, so as to soften their hearts and to confirm the covenant between them, and in hopes of instilling faith in their hearts. There was not one of their kings who did not come to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in disguise, and he came to the table of the Sultan among the masses who came, so as not to be recognized. The Sultan was aware of that. He knew of it in general terms, but not in detail. Hence he honored them and showed them great tolerance, kindness, and generosity. The Sultan returned to Damascus. In 5 Shawal 588 Hijri, he set out with his troops from Jerusalem heading towards Damascus. He appointed as his deputy in Jerusalem Izzaddin Jurdik and as its judge Baha'uddin Yusuf ibn Rafi ibn Tamim al Shafi. He passed through the valley of Habib and stayed overnight at the Templar Pond. He then arrived in Nablus in the morning, where he examined and inspected the city. Then he left it and started passing through fortresses and towns to check on their situation and financial affairs, restore rights, put an end to transgression and encourage good deeds. On his journey, Pohimond of Antioch came to him and he honored him, treated him kindly, and gave him a great deal of wealth and beautiful clothing. Alimad al-Katib al-Isfahani was among his Anchuaraj, and he wrote about every halt he made and every state he passed. He noted, On Monday he crossed Ain al Jar, heading towards Marj Yabus, and all his troubles ceased. Prominent people of Damascus came out, and we camped on Tuesday at al Arrada. People came out to receive him as usual, and on Wednesday morning, meaning 16 Shawal, we came to the garden of Damascus, entering it safe and sound but not immortal. The Sultan's absence from the city had lasted for four years. All the people of Damascus came out to receive him, women and men, and it was a day of celebration. Everyone who was in the city came out. The people gathered in the forenoon and there was joy and happiness everywhere. He met with his children, both old and young, and the envoys of the kings came to him from all over. He spent the rest of that year hunting, attending the courthouse to pass judgments, and striving to do good deeds. When Eid al-Adha came, one of the poets praised him in an ode. 
The leader of the Hajj was accused of writing to Salahuddin against the Caliph. In 588 Hijri, the leader of the Hajj in Baghdad, whose name was Tashtagin, who had been the leader of the pilgrims for 20 years and was of outstanding good character, was accused of writing to Salahuddin ibn Ayyub, telling him to come to Iraq to capture it because no one would stop him. This was a fabrication against him, but despite that he was arrested and humiliated and his property confiscated. In 588 Hijri, Abul Murhaf and Numairi died. He had studied Hadith and was a man of letters. He had contracted smallpox at the age of 14, which had weakened his eyesight so that he was unable to see distant objects. But he could see things that were close to him and he did not need a guide. He traveled to Iraq to seek treatment for his eyes, but the doctors told him that there was no hope. So he occupied himself with memorizing the Quran. He kept company with righteous people and ascetics, and he did the right thing. He wrote reams of poetry. On one occasion, he was asked about his matab and beliefs, and he composed the following lines of verses. I love Ali and Fatima and their children, but I do not deny the superiority of the two sheikhs, Abu Bakr and Umar. I disavow myself of anyone who harmed Uthman, as I disavow myself of Ibn Muljam, the one who killed Ali. I like the people of Hadith for their truthfulness, and I cannot choose for company anyone other than them. End of part 6 of chapter 3